Meet Professionals is a show that brings you insightful conversations with professionals. Today's guest on the show is a Muslima, a women's empowerment devotee. She's also a medical practitioner, and she's the first woman to be assigned to the White House by the Army to serve as a White House physician assistant to President Barack Obama. But not only that, she's also the first medical officer to ever serve as a military aide to two vice presidents to the United States of America. You want to know more about this strong woman? Watch the video till the end. This is Meet Professionals with me, IBKB. Welcome to the show, Madam Saiba Tumansai. Thank you so, so much, IB, for having me here today. It is a distinct honor and pleasure to be with right, you. It's all the pleasure is ours. Um, so how have you been? Fantastic. It's been six months of being here in Sierra Leone, and it's been, it's been interesting, to say the least. Really? But I'm excited to be back home. Yes. So how, how is Sierra Leone for you? Sierra Leone is great. I'm getting, I'm getting used to it. Um, but, but it's good. It's good. My children are adopting, adapting very well, and that's very, very important to me. So yes, it's, it's, it's been good. OK, good. So, good. so let's start the conversation. Um, mm -hmm. You know this is a bit professional show. Mm -hmm. So let's start with you telling us about your background. Um, from where you started to being uh, someone who is um, appointed at the White House, the Air Office in the United States of America, yeah. and also as a Muslim and also a very strong advocate. Take us through that journey so viewers can learn from who Seba Tumansa is. Yeah. So that journey, you know, it's, it's, it, because it's a three-part sort of question, because all of those are different phases of my life, right? Okay. The Muslima yeah. part comes towards the end, and, and uh, I'm alhamdulillah that it came toward the end. It came at a part that I'm, that I'm ready to embrace that part of it. But starting with me leaving uh, Sierra Leone in 1994 and then heading to the States, not knowing what I was going to do, and then just literally said, I'm going to join the military. Okay. Best, best decision ever. Sometimes, some okay. decisions you don't have to deliberate on. Uh, some okay. decisions, you need to go with it. And it was the best decision I could have made. And, and I fared well. I think coming from a disadvantage, in a sense, a country like this, it inspires you and motivates you to work harder than the next person. So when other people were taking it easy to do things, I wanted to be the best. I was competing with myself because I was representing not just myself, I was representing a country that people had never heard of or when they heard of it, it was always tied to something negative. And so right. I wanted to be the fastest girl that could run. I wanted to be the one that could shoot the best. I wanted to be the best at all that. And it helped me because I started to get promoted a lot quicker than other people. I got leadership positions quickly. Um, and then it led me to a fantastic opportunity that I hope that we get to talk about. Yeah. But the Muslim, the Muslim part happened. Uh, unfortunately, my father passed away in 2019. I grew up in a Muslim household. When I moved to the States, um, I just kind of became, you know, I was 19, almost turning 20. So I just, Misa, I wanted to enjoy life, right? So I, I kind of put faith second. Um, and then 2019, Allah tried me. And immediately, it wasn't, I didn't think of anything else to do other than the turn to Allah. And, and my life has changed from 2019 to today. I've become a hijabi. I pray. I inspire my children, encourage my children on that path. And fighting for women to also lend their voices to Islam. Not that I want them to be moms, not that I need them to go lead prayers, that we also can be learned and knowledgeable in it and be able to represent women in Islam um, in, in a perfect way. So wow. that's the so exciting, so yes, exciting. Yes, yes. But, but I'd like us to talk briefly on the area of um, your presence in the military, because yeah. as an African woman and also a Muslim, I'm sure you, you were faced with a lot of challenges, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how, how did you overcome those challenges? Well, the first one is to always remember to correct people when they say your name wrong, right? The first part was they never got my name correct, right? So okay. it was, you know, to say your name. So where are you from again? And then you say, you're from Sierra Leone. It says, where's that, you know? So it's always that. But I always remember the back of my mind where I'm from, what I'm representing. And so that journey, I was, when you talk about minority, that's the minority of the minority, right? Not only are you, yes, you're African, but you're African from one of the smallest countries, again, that people really don't know about. Um, and you're a Muslim, very small population in the military. Yeah. A lot of the Muslims there, again, didn't, they weren't active uh, uh, followers of it. The, yeah, I'm a Muslim, but didn't really follow it because the military uh, schedule was very difficult for you to be able to, to do it, uh, unless you were very assertive about it, and some of us, just didn't have a voice at that time. You know, you're new to the military, I'm a foreigner, I'm not going to try to make any trouble. So yeah, yeah, if sure. Friday, Juma, if they don't say you can go, that's fine, right? Yeah, you're gonna go. But eventually I said, no, that's not what I should be doing. I'm not gonna compromise my faith. And eventually it, 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 it worked out. And the military is very supportive of all faiths. The United States military is very supportive of all faiths. Uh, every Juma I was able to do it. I think once I 
found the courage to say, no, no, it's not wrong to ask. I was able to be able to do my Juma prayers. I was able to observe Ramadan. They made concessions for me when it's Ramadan time. If I had to do a fitness test, we will push a fitness test later. So they, they were very uh, accommodating. Back then, we were not allowed to wear the hijab. They only changed the military to wear hijabs uh, in 2017. And that was the year that I actually retired from the military. Oh, really? Yeah. It was just a coincidence. It's just oh, coincidence. Okay, yeah, okay, yes, okay. yes. So, Okay, now this brings us to the AAR farm because we read a lot of things about you on the internet. And um, one of the things I found fascinating was the fact that you were the first um, woman to be sent by the military to the, um, the White House as a, a physician assistant. Mm -hmm. And um, went through it again, we saw that you were one of the first women to work under two um, presidents of the United States. Yes. So, Take us through those exciting leadership positions that you went through, and um, yeah. how did you inspire others as an African? Yeah, I think that the key thing is always to remember that someone's watching you. No matter what you're doing, someone's always watching. And that assignment to the White House was one, I was in Iraq, I was not even thinking in my head that that was a job that I would even qualify for. Right. And the lady that manages all military assignments for physician assistants, she actually called and says, you need to apply for this program, up for this, for this assignment. And I said, well, I'm in Iraq. I came up with all these excuses of why. Because I think a little part of me was scared of the defeat. Like, I don't want to apply. And then they say no. So I'd rather just not even apply. Yeah. And she was very insistent because she had seen something in me. She had seen my military record. You can do it. You need to apply. I'm not saying you have the job, but I want you to make so the first effort, try, just yeah. at least try. Yeah. And, and alhamdulillah for that lady, because I did, I applied, and even, I kind of applied, but didn't put all a lot of effort into it, applied, and then I gave it to a friend who was heading to the States. I said, when you get to the States, can you drop it off in the mail for me? That's how much emphasis, because a little part of me still had that mentality that I'm an African girl, a woman has never been a, has never been there. 15 years that the army has been sending people to work for presidents and vice presidents, a woman has never been. Yeah. Why would they pick the Sierra Leonean woman of all the women in the military? Yeah, yeah. Why would they pick the Sierra Leonean woman who was only a captain at the time? Mostly they're looking for majors at the time. So I looked at all these disadvantages, but it worked out. I went and interviewed I, I was with nine other people who were, again, I looked at everybody. I kind of stacked myself and I said, oh, no, this is, this is probably not good. But I interviewed well. Confidence is very, very important. Okay. Knowing, again, where you come from and what you're representing. Everything I did, and I'm not saying this because I'm on this, the show with you. Everything I did was knowing that I am representing Sierra Leone. Sabah Sumansari is representing Sierra Leone, and I can't let the next American, the next soldier meet another Sierra Leonean and say, oh, I met one before. Yeah, that person yeah. was trash. That person was terrible. Yeah. That person was lazy. I wanted to be the An standard example, bearer yeah. for every Sierra Leonean that they ever met. If they read about it, I wanted that. So, so that was that's that. When you talk about the vice president part, uh, that is almost that's it's not a political assignment. I was already in with uh, Vice President Biden when his time ended. I did uh, I did more time actually with Vice President Biden uh, when his time ended. The administration ended. As a military assignment, we're not tied to politics, so I had to roll over and be okay. Vice President Pence. But what changed was I then became his senior military aide. He gets to decide, he picked, and I was his senior military aide, uh, which then means that I get to brief him, teach him all of the things military related as the vice president, the decisions and things that he has to make. And there, there, there are many, and we can't talk about them, unfortunately, on, on the show. Yeah. But it, it was a very, and it created a bond between he and I, because okay. what he didn't know was something that I had to be able to, to sure, be there. Sure, yeah. So when he met the four other military aides, he thought he only had one, because every day was me 24 seven from the day that they uh, won the election. I was with them 24 seven for months on end. Wow. Right? And so when he met four other people, he says, oh, I, had, I thought you were the only person I had. And I became literally part of their family. And talking about someone who's accepted me, again, as, a, as an African, as a Muslim, my children and everything, he was just, it, was, it was just a fantastic opportunity to have. You know, the first woman, the first African woman, you also worked with um, the first black American president, right? Yes, yes. So uh, how did it look? Yeah, it was it was it was good, and and to this day, I can assure you that if President Obama walked in, or Vice President Biden, or President Biden walked in, or Vice President Pence walked in, they will they undeniably will be able to say, greetings to Saibatsu. They will be able to say that because that's the impression that I left upon them. But I think I was also it wasn't like in shock. I think every day was just I can't believe this is actually happening to okay. me. 
And it's 10 years of every day of me entering the White House complex. Every day I put my badge and I'm able to walk in, not thinking that every day for 10 years my badge is actually going to work. Someday yeah. they're yeah. gonna say, oh no, no, you're from Sierra Leone. Yeah. Why is your yeah. badge working? What yeah. are you doing here? Yeah. But yes, no, alhamdulillah for the opportunity. It was, it was great. And to watch leadership, to watch leadership at that level, to see the president interact with other heads of state, to see vice presidents interact with other, you know, to see leadership at that level, then you separate that and see their personal lives, how they are as fathers, how they are as husbands, how they are as grandfathers. It was absolutely Amazing, fascinating, yeah. you know, yeah, and how you relate your family to them or how you would like to be, right? So yeah. you get to see every single thing. You get front row seating to their lives, how yeah. they deal with, you know, Vice President Biden uh, at the time, now president, had to deal with his uh, the passing of his son, right? To watch that happen, I was right there, right? To see all of the things, the trials that they right, themselves right. go through, they're human beings just like us, right? Yeah. And they're no different. So it's, it's a unique opportunity that I will forever, ever cherish. And I'm so grateful to be able to represent our country well, but also to be able to get front row seating to that and bring it back and hopefully make a change here in Sierra Leone. And we're also thankful for actually representing Sierra Leone and also sharing your, your fascinating story to our viewers. So we'll hold it right there and we'll go for a short break and we will be right back. So welcome again to the show with me, IBKB Meet Professionals. Well, Meet Professionals is a show where I hold high-level conversations with experts, change management experts, leaders, and many more. Well, for today's professionals is Madam Saibatu Mansari, someone who has worked in the highest office in the United States of America. We've been moving the conversation from a Muslim to someone who has worked in the United States, in the military, as well as a medical practitioner. Welcome again to the show, Madam Seva. Thank you, thank you. It's been great. Okay, good. So now let's move the conversation to um, the aspect because now when we looked at your profile again, we saw that you were the director of the medical operations in, in the White House Medical Unit and also you were also the first woman to hold that of a position. So what are some of the things you were doing in that White House Medical Unit and um, what, what do we learn from that as Africans and also yeah. to the world at large? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very it's a very unique opportunity. When when you said that I was, you know, we started off, we said that I was assigned to the White House to serve as the first physician assistant, right? That yeah. medical unit has physician assistants, it has doctors, it has nurses, and we all have specific skills we bring to the table. Okay. The physician assistants bring the trauma skills. So our role is to make sure that the president, the vice president, if something happens, we are there to make sure that they don't die from some something that's treatable as or preventable, uh -huh. a gunshot wound or things like that. Okay. It's a complementary team, right? So the doctor, the nurse is the is the intensivist, so they make sure the breathing is correct, and the doctor does doctor stuff. So the three of us work together as a team. But the physician assistant is the one that goes out, and we are the ones to make sure that hospitals and ambulances and all of those things are in place for when the president or the vice president arrives in any given country or okay. any given city. And so when I became the director of operations, originally I was the person that would go out and check out hospitals. I think I've probably visited over 100 hospitals, if, if, if I remember. I've been to 45 countries based off of working at the White wow. House. But yeah, 45 countries. Some <laughs> I've been to a couple of times. And so if you need any tips on tourism, I, I'll, I tell think, you, I think I need some. I'll tell you where <laughs> yeah. to go. And I'll yeah. definitely tell you where not to go. Yeah. But, and i also tell you what country you do not want to get sick in. Okay. But, um, um, but I, I've been to over uh, probably a, a hundred different hospitals. And what we do is to check the quality of care in these hospitals. Are you able to, to, to take care of the president of the United States? The most important thing in the United States is continuity of government. We cannot have a gap, a lapse of any sort, which is why our president and we have a vice president and they're ready to go at, at each time, right? We have that here in Sierra Leone and I, and I understand that, but in this case, we wanna make sure the medical piece, which is so important, is the first part, other than national security, yeah, yeah. that can kind of create that gap. And so what I, my work was when the president says, I am going to, let's say he has a bilateral meeting uh, or some sort of uh, UN meeting of sorts, and he's going to a random country, my job was to be able to lean forward, figure out all the best hospitals within that country okay. or that city, 
identify that they meet the criteria. We have a criteria that we followed, you know, whether level one, level two, level three, I don't want to get too complicated, but a certain amount of doctors, the qualifications of doctors, we had to have all of the specialists ever that you would have in that country. So neurology, your radiologist, your endocrine, and all of these are like, you're thinking, well, does he have any of these illnesses? He does not have all of these illnesses, but he you could have them. them but place. I want to make sure that they're there. Okay, I want okay. to make sure the ambulance is ready. If something happens, that ambulance is ready to treat him, right? Now, these are complementary systems because, again, the safety of the president is also important, right? So these right, are complementary right, systems. Right. They're not the sole system because then there will be a gap, again, if something happens to that ambulance, right? So we want to make sure that the, the ambulance, the evacuation system is correct. We want to make sure that the helicopter, because some countries, they can't manage all of these, so I may have to get him to the next nearest country. Is okay. there a helicopter that can get him to the next nearest country? Yes. What's the flight time to that country? What's uh, and we're working with you know air traffic control to make sure that when I do activate, because we don't want you to shoot the plane down. Yeah, right? if you're yeah, sure. Judges are, so it it's is a very event, right? it's it's a very big. You have to think of every single thing, right? Every single threat every single so. every single threat as yeah, exactly every single threat. Now he gets to that other country. Someone else has to also have been to that country check out that hospital. What is that hospital near, close to? What is that hotel he's staying close to? Because again, national security is still something that we're very, we're very uh, focused on. So we make sure, A, we send the right people out, right? Qualified people that have been trained. We've taught them how to do this um, pre-hospital, we call it pre-advanced, but it's pre-hospital surveys. So they go in, they make sure they ask all the right questions. They ask the questions about the, the equipment, the physicians, who's going to be uh, on staff that night. I need your phone number because when I call you, you need to answer on the first ring because the president will not keep the president of the United States waiting. Um, and, and we kind of go through that. So I did that for um, a little bit over a year, but in that time, it, it wasn't just managing the president. Now I go back to managing the president and the vice president and their families. So if the first lady is traveling or the second lady is traveling or their children are traveling, you're doing the same exact the same thing. thing. The same exact uh, that's thing. That's a very big role. That's a very big role. As long yeah. as they have taken on, yes, it's a very big role. So it was it was um, a lot of phone calls, a lot of thinking, a lot of creative, a lot of innovation as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, our role was to make sure and, and also thinking of countries, not, not to digress, but countries, if, if there's uh, public health issues, right, to make sure that the president is, is prepared. Rabies is a very big thing. A lot of countries don't carry the rabies uh, uh, um, antibody or, or immunoglobulin, let's call it that. As you all know, you may not know this, but in, in Sierra Leone, there's 250,000 or so stray animals. So let's yeah. say the president were to come here and he gets bit by an animal and there's not a rabies vaccination to give him. So I have to ensure that there's a rabies vaccine available or that we bring it with us, right? So it's, you have to think, you talk about someone who has attention to detail. You will not succeed at that job if you didn't have attention to detail because you have to think of every, every single, single thing, thing. Yeah. down to the water. Mr. President, do not brush your teeth with the water coming out of the faucet or the tap because the water is has not, it's not pure, it's not clean, you know, it's all of those things. Please use bottled water. So every single thing has to be thought of for them because his job is to run a country. It is not to think about all of those things. That's why we were there. So uh, I, I will end on that. On that. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> that was a great one. That was a great one. I think it's important, uh, more especially as an African, you feel so proud to be able to serve um, the president in a white man's country. And as, as an African, you're doing yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So now, um, as an African, again, as a Sierra Leonean, are you, do you have any plans of coming back to Sierra Leone to lend your expertise permanently because you've been around for over five months now. Yes. Mm -hmm. And are you thinking of coming back home to be able to, to learn, to give back to our society so that we learn from these experiences, these skills, and these um, uh, monumental sacrifices you've made in other parts of the world yeah. and uh, you are celebrated over there. Yeah. So are you planning on coming back permanently or You'll be going back pretty soon. No, no, no. I, I have moved. I have moved here. I live here. I, I have to go back every so often, right? Just because I have little children, so they can have just a little bit of American left in them, just a little bit. Okay. But I, if I ever, you know, when I go back to, to the States, would be maybe six weeks or so. But I have permanently moved. My children go to school here. They actually speak Creole. We, we talk Creole now, which is very strange to me. Really? I, yes, in six months. My son 
because this is a this is a funny story. It, the, what pushed him to, to learn it? Because he, and I want to talk this bank you. He, he thinks that the Nkongusa na di na di football field. He said the Nkongusa me is our land. So he okay. wanted to learn because okay. he thinks that they're talking about him. And it pushed him to learn. And now he won't speak to me in English anymore. He only speaks it speaks in Creole. So uh, they have embraced it. Uh, their version of Sierra Leone is different from my version. He tells me that he says, "Mom, you made Sierra Leone sound like a bad place. It's, it's not that bad." I said, "Well, you don't have to go fetch water. I had to go fetch water." Yeah. And that's yeah, a different yeah. thing. So yes, I am here. Um, to answer that question, I want to lend my service. I am at service to this country. I feel committed, dedicated, obligated to this country. This is the country where I received all of my education. I went to King Haman, I went to FSSG, I went to uh, St. Francis Secondary School, uh, senior, uh, senior Secondary School. So all of my education, you know, my to get into you know, for the army to even accept me is because I got it here from you, Sierra Leone. You, you and so, in my yeah. mind, my patriotism, I've done 26 years in the United States. I am also patriotic to Sierra Leone. I came back to make a difference, to be part of the solution. Not to come and take over the whole change, but to be part of the solution. And to, to answer that question, I can't go knock on every minister or whoever makes changes door. But I would hope that as much as I'm active on social media, that someone says she has an expertise and we need it. And I want, and I'm looking in the camera, I want no money. I'm not here for a concert, what, what do they call them? Um, the people that you, you, you give, uh, what's the word? I don't, I don't need you to hire me. I don't need you to give me any money whatsoever. Um, I don't need consultants. I am not here to be a consultant. I'm not here to get a political position. I want nothing. I literally came back because I want to be the change that I wanted when I was a child. I wanted to have a female role model. I wanted to see a Muslim woman that looked like me and I was, that would have inspired me to probably wear my hijab way back then. Um, I wanted somebody that was fighting for youth that made it a priority that I didn't just have to hang out it's a Barigo Junction eating fry fry at night or Vincent Drive Junction or whatever other things that you did back then. Right? Yeah, yeah. I want that. I want to represent that. And so I am here for any, any ministerial building of sorts or minister of sorts who says I have an expertise and I have a lot of it, right? You call me and I can assure you I will be there to lend my advice free. I don't need anything from you. But oh, by the way, the Mansory Foundation, you can support them while you're at it. <laughs> and not financially, just, you know, just make sure that. Okay, we... okay, good. I think that that's important. And um, for us, uh, Sierra Leoneans, I think having you back serving, that would be very great, in yes. fact, because um, other countries do pay for these services, as yeah. you as you rightly mentioned. So um, another thing that's important, again, you've been so much active on social media. Since you came back, you've been very much active in mentorship um, um, on issues that affect women and girls in Sierra Leone. So what would be your advice to young Sierra Leoneans and also young people in the continent of Africa and the world at large? Yeah, I think it's always important, <clears throat> and I said in the beginning, to never forget where you come from, right? No matter where you go, no matter what position you attain, you never forget where you come from. And I think if you use it as a guide and knowing that you're representing, right? I went into my situation that I'm going to win the gold medal for Sierra Leone because they're women, they're young girls, they're youth that will never have the opportunity that I had for 10 years to enter the White House. And I am the representation for them. And I'm going to go get that gold medal and I'm going to bring that back to Sierra Leone. The, uh, or to whatever country you're from. Now, the other part also is that no matter what you learn, no matter what experience you gain, if you never bring it back to your country to improve your country, you will be one of the people that will be in Australia, the UK, the US, and all these other countries talking about how bad your country is, right? You are joining everybody else to talk negatively about, speak negatively about your country. We will only improve if the diasporas, right, come back and lend a hand to their country. I am not saying everybody needs to make a bold move like I did, just pack up your house and move. But I am saying that we have so many, uh, so many Sierra Leoneans around the world. In, I mean, they have so many degrees that I can't even count. So much experience that they can lend a hand, a voice, something back to our country yeah. to improve so it, improve, right? Improve. But that's we are the, improving yeah. another man's country. country. Yeah, that's what the are we problem. doing? Yeah. The, the Especially when the continent is suffering from bringing it in. Yes. A lot of what we want is outside. Yes, like bring it back. I yeah. was able, I was born in the United States and moved here when I was five because my parents were there going to school, student visa. They graduated, they didn't stay. I'm going to come back and I'm going to be part of the workforce here in Sierra Leone and brought me to Sierra Leone at five. And where we started was mine 91. 
let me tell you, that was not America. They're nowhere near America, right? So I started <laughs> rough. But again, that's the, the yeah. advice I have. Yeah. Never forget where you came from. Do not let your environment dictate what you think you're going to be or what you will be because I am just like you. I fetched water. I eat tombi, I ate grown soup, I like butterscotch, I did all of that stuff. And here, I, and then I worked at the White House and now I am back in Sierra Leone because this is for, I am patriotic to this country and I expect our youth to be the same. So that's my advice to our youth. Okay, thank you so much. I think um, if you're watching this show, I think uh, I you, should be, there, you should be so <laughs> excited with what Madam Sebato has just uh, said to us. Um, so finally, um, this platform meets professionals. One of the things we normally do at the end of the year, we want to organize a mentorship program uh -huh. for viewers following the show and also young people in Sierra Leone. So if we contact you, are you free or are you, are you willing to, to come off here or lend your skills to um, young Sierra Leoneans? Can we rewind the part where I said I am here to give my service to this country for free? Not as a concept. I am at your service, IB Kimbe. I respect the work that you're doing. You are also, I follow your work on Facebook. When you have students, because I tell you, I was a student and I was disgruntled at all my teachers. When you have a student who says something so positively about you, yeah. demonstrates your character as well. So you will forever have my time. I don't have a lot of it, but the small that it's I small. have, I, I will I definitely lend it to be mentors. Yeah. I want to mentor our youth because they will not be able to go abroad, but I am back. And if I can bring that to them, the little that I can do, you have my support. And I say that in that camera, you have my support. I can assure you of that. So, you wow. Have. So we want to thank you so very much yes. for honoring our invitation and also sharing um, your story to viewers. I think this is so inspirational. And this is where we draw out the curtains for today's edition of the program, It's Professionals. And please don't so forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Of course, you've heard from... Um, a an African woman who has actually worked in the highest office in the United States of America, interacted with a lot of leaders, global leaders, as well as the vice presidents, as well as the president of the United States of America. Till, till we meet again for another edition of the program, I want to say thank you so much for watching. Goodbye. Thank you. Hello, my name is Saiba Tumansare, and I am a professional and a retired United States Army officer. Thanks for watching. You can also be a professional, and don't forget to subscribe to Meet Professionals' YouTube channel.